I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Dave Gawson who is Professor of Biology at the University of Sussex. Dave is also the founder of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust and author of three books, the most recent of which is The Garden Jungle or Gardening to Save the Planet. I feel like this episode follows on perfectly from last week's podcast with Chris Williams of Edible Culture because what Dave says really reinforces the ethos behind that nursery. And it also fits in with something that's been really bothering me, which is the whole popularity of wildlife gardens. Because as you'll hear from the start of the interview, wildlife gardens will only do good if you source your plants from the right place. If you don't, you're actually doing more harm than good. We did work a couple of years ago on pesticides in garden centre plants, Mm. particularly ones being sold as bee friendly or perfect for pollinators, the RHS logo. And the RHS basically allow any garden centre to put that logo on their plants as a marketing tool, as long as it's the right species of plant. Right, okay. Regardless of what pesticides are in it. And Mm. we basically bought bee-friendly plants from all the main outlets around here, Y Vale and Mm. B&Q and so on. And 70% of them had insecticides in them, usually a whole cocktail of insecticides. And they're being sold to people on the basis that they will support insects in your garden and actually they're going to poison them, Mm. which strikes me as pretty outrageous. So one of the things we did when we were kind of raising the profile of this work and trying to put pressure on garden centres to stop was we contacted RHS and said, your logo is being used on these plants full of insecticides. You know, what are you going to do about it? Hoping that they would perhaps initiate some kind of work with garden centres to produce a range of genuinely bee-friendly plants that were guaranteed free of insecticide or something. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? Mm. Basically, they kind of went completely silent for about 18 months. And then at the end of it, they changed it from perfect for pollinators to plants for pollinators. One bloody word. Essentially sidestepping the issue and saying, okay, we admit they're not perfect for pollinators. They might be full of poison, but they're plants for pollinators. And that was the sole thing they did. So they didn't do anything to help. They just tried to duck the issue by changing one bloody word. So I kind of lost respect for the RHS at that point. I didn't realise that they could put that tag in the plants as long as they were the right species, regardless of where they were grown. So they could be importing them from who knows where. They might not even know the supply chain and what's been used on that plant, the people that are buying it in. The whole system is opaque. If you go to a garden centre and say, I see you're selling this plant as being bee friendly. Can you tell me whether it's got any pesticides in it? They won't have the foggiest idea. They just got it from a wholesaler who got it from somewhere, probably not even in this country. An awful lot of them shipped in from the Netherlands where they're produced in vast glass houses with lots of chemicals. That information isn't attached to the plant. Once it's been shipped on, nobody knows. They just sell them. They don't care. They just want them to look nice so that people buy them. The whole thing stinks, really. It's pretty irresponsible. And it's also exploiting people. You know, it's basically taking the hard-earned money of well-meaning people who want to make their garden wildlife-friendly and selling them poisoned plants, which Mm. ought to be illegal. I suspect it might even be illegal. I mean, I don't know what trading standards would make of that, but I haven't yet managed to get any interest in fighting it through legal avenues, but that's something that should be explored. I thought people might have the idea that they can buy these plants and the insecticides that have been used might wear off or wash off after a period of time at which point the plants will be okay. Is that true? It is true. The pesticides don't last forever. As the plant grows, they get diluted, but also they do break down. But it varies enormously between different types of pesticides. Some are gone within a few days, but some last for years. So the kind of most notorious ones are neonicotinoids, which thankfully most of them are now banned in Europe. But When we screened garden centre plants two years ago, the majority of them had neonicotinoids in them. And they last for certainly three or four years in declining amounts, you know. So if someone has already bought a plant or a whole garden full of plants from the garden centre in the last year or two, I wouldn't suggest they rip them all up. 
you might as well leave them in now because the most harm would have been done when they were fresh from the garden centre with the most pesticides in it. And it will decline and it will eventually disappear. But I would say don't buy any more unless you can find a garden centre that can guarantee they're pesticide free. So there are organic garden centres. If you haven't got one locally, there are organic garden centres online. There's a really nice one called Rosie B that I buy stuff from. She's based in Oxfordshire. It's a little company that specialises in rearing bee-friendly plants all organically. So, you know, you can get hold of them. You don't have to go to Yvale or one of the big chains. Or grow them yourself. It's much cheaper. Get a packet of seeds. The seeds of flowers, I don't think, are normally treated with anything. If there are little residues of pesticides by the time it's grown into a plant, it's probably not a serious issue. So, yeah, grow your own. Or plants swap with friends and neighbours and that kind of thing much more sustainable, not only because of the pesticides, but if you think about it, people think that gardening is a green activity, don't they? You know, if, what could be more green than growing flowers and vegetables in your garden? But actually, many people's idea of gardening is they drive in their car in the spring to a big garden centre. They buy a whole boot full of annual bedding plants, which have been treated in loads of pesticides. They're sold in disposable plastic trays, probably grown in peat-based composts. Probably they'll buy a few bottles of pesticides while they're there. Maybe a statue or two and who knows what else from garden centres sell everything these days. And then they drive home and plant their bedding plants out. They flower for a few months. They don't attract any insects because they're intensively bred, hopeless, ugly things, in my view. There's nothing green about that as a way of gardening at all. I don't think many people really appreciate it. So gardening can be fantastic, but as some people practice it, it's an environmental disaster. For a lot of people, that would involve a lot of patience. It would involve seeing gardening as a long-term activity, which I think probably people aren't so good at nowadays. Or they move around, or they may not have the space to grow things from seed. The sense I got from reading your book is that you are genuinely saying that we need to slam the brakes on that hard now. We need to go, actually, do you know what, that's it. We can't be going to garden centres, filling up our trolley with 100 quid's worth of plants at the weekend. Lovely as that may be, I think we need to actually take it quite seriously and say, mm, that's not sustainable. Yeah, I study bumblebees and why they're declining. And that's where I kind of started. But I've got drawn into kind of the whole mess we're making of the environment as a result, because what's happening to bees is actually happening to everything. This kind of assault that we're making on the environment. We live on this amazing planet with all this beautiful wildlife and all these natural resources, and we're just squandering the whole thing in the most kind of bizarrely reckless and stupid way. Not just, obviously, by the way we garden, but in hundreds of different ways. But gardening seems to me one area where not only if it's done badly can it be harmful, but where there is potential to do lots of good and actually to try and help tackle some of these big environmental issues like declining insect populations and wildlife populations generally. And things like even climate change. If you garden in the right way, you can lock up carbon in your soil. And that also makes the soil more healthy and fertile. And so you can grow better flowers and vegetables and so on. So it's kind of good for everybody. But people need to know how to do that and they need to understand why it's important. And at the moment, there's just a lack of education, a lack of awareness about the seriousness of the kind of big environmental issues that we face. I don't know whether you'll know too much about this. It is a little bit off topic, but going back to the idea of seeds, I guess some of them are treated with fungicides, are they? Is that a problem? You wouldn't think a fungicide would be harmful to bees say but there is evidence that at least some fungicides are actually quite poisonous to bees and it's just emerged from a number of scientific studies in the last year or two that said i'm not really clear on exactly what is on most seeds if anything we know that when farmers buy seeds whatever it might be oil seed rape then that is commonly treated with fungicides and until recently was treated with neonicotinoid insecticides. That bit's now been banned, but they're still often treated with fungicides. And in the future, they may be treated with other types of insecticides and so on. And that's quite a big dose of pesticide that's stuck to the seed when the farmer sows it in the ground. And we know that that can be harmful because it gets into the soil, it gets into the nectar and pollen of the plant if it flowers and so on. When it comes to people's gardens, the seeds that you can buy from a garden centre, they're not labelled as having been treated generally. And so far as I'm aware, they're not deliberately coated in any kind of pesticide. I don't think they should need to be, and I hope they're not, but I honestly don't know. And there seems to be no legal requirement to tell us what's mm. on those seeds. So it's a bit of a, 
grey area. So it made me think if you were in any doubt, it might be better to opt for organic seeds. Absolutely. The safest option is to get organic seeds and there are suppliers. They're not quite as easily obtained, but they're out there. And with the internet these days, anyone can track them down and buy organic mm. flower and veg seeds if they want. So that goes back to my question, which was about the Soil Association label. So I've been speaking to a lot of people at trade shows and garden shows lately. A lot of people who don't have Soil Association approval have been saying to me, well, actually, you know, it's not worth the paper it's written on or it's expensive or it's not worth it because I know my stuff's organic, but I don't want to go through the paperwork. Do you know anything about that? I can understand where they're coming from. I think the Soil Association certification is work the paper is written on in the sense that they are pretty strict. If you adhere to their organic standards, there should be no pesticide residues in anything you're producing. But I completely agree that it's expensive. It's a big hurdle to small operations. It's fine if you're a, you know, a big scale organic farmer. Well, it's more affordable. But if you're a small horticulture operation or just producing plants to sell locally or whatever on a small scale, then it's too expensive. So there are lots of people producing pesticide-free products who aren't registered with the Soil Association. I mean, I suppose it's then you just have to take it on trust. To my mind, if someone you know has a, a nursery and says they don't use any pesticides, I'm kind of inclined to believe them. Why would they lie? You know, it would be a strange thing to do. Usually these people are really well-meaning. You know, their heart is very much in the right place. They wouldn't dream of using any pesticides. And just because they can't afford the Soil Association certification, I don't think we should discriminate against them for that. Mm. It's worth paying attention to that labelling, but we shouldn't kind of dismiss everybody that can't afford it. So in your book, your new book, you also were talking about natives and non-native plants. I think you said that you weren't going to get to puritanical about using only natives you were saying you know the kind of pollinators and everything they'll still use the non-natives what i've been sort of looking into on the podcast a little bit is about the benefit of non-natives as host species so is there a kind of importance to include the natives as well as the non-natives from that perspective yeah so purely from the point of view of pollinators bees and all the other pollinating insects this weak evidence that they really care where the plants come from, unless they're some really exotic hummingbird pollinated plant or bird pollinated plant from South America, Australia or whatever, in which case it may well not be much use to European pollinators. But most, for example, North American plants, the insects that they've co-evolved with are mostly very similar to European plants. So there are lots of North American plants that are fantastic for pollinators and similarly plants from Asia and so on. So most native plants have associated herbivores, maybe caterpillars of butterflies or moths, or it may be shield bugs or any number of insects. There are far more species of insects that are herbivores than pollinators. And some plants, particularly bigger shrubs and trees, have hundreds of associated insects. If you didn't have any native trees and grew only exotic trees, which tend not to support many herbivores, there are some of our native insects that can switch on to feeding on weird and wonderful exotic shrubs and so on. But in general, if you grow something that's exotic, it'll support far fewer herbivorous insects than if it's native. If people are thinking, what can I plant in my garden? And they're looking for, be it a baseous plant or a shrub or a tree, then if they kind of at least checked out whether there was a native species that was suitable first, and if there isn't, you know, in a garden, I don't think you should be too puritanical and tell everyone they have to try and grow 100% native plants. For one, you're never going to get very far, you know. We're all far too accustomed to having beautiful, exotic plants in our gardens to persuade everyone to give them up. But there are lots of really nice native trees and shrubs and plants, beautiful wildflowers and so on that look nice, that are well suited to our conditions here because they're native, that will support pollinators and support a whole bunch of herbivores. So, you know, all else being equal, then yeah, go for the natives when you can, but don't get completely hung up on it is my advice. Where could people find out about what species might be? It's quite hard. I mean, for some native plants, it's been well studied. So, for example, oak trees, people have catalogued the insects associated with oak trees. And I I forget the precise total, but there's something like three or four hundred different species of insect associated with oaks. Of course, not everyone has room for an oak tree. They're pretty big, but I'm lucky I've got a couple. But if you do have room, you can guarantee you will support a whole bunch of biodiversity right there in your garden. 
for many native plants, there's no easily available kind of list of all the different creatures that will visit them. But you can pretty much guarantee that anything that's native will have associated wildlife. So I wouldn't suggest people worry about exactly what will turn up if they grow a hawthorn or a blackthorn or whatever it might be. You can be pretty sure there'll be something. Most people probably couldn't identify it anyway. There's so many species of insects that turn up in gardens if you're gardening in the right kind of way. I can tell you about the bees and the butterflies, but uh, when it comes to some of the more obscure things, then actually very few people that can identify all of them. There are literally thousands of species just in my garden. I say that without knowing, I've not catalogued them all yet. There's this really nice example that I mentioned in the book. This lady, Jennifer Owen, had a little tiny urban garden in Leicestershire, something like a tenth of an acre. And she managed to count over 2,000 different species of animal and plant in her garden over about 30 years. She was completely obsessive. <laughs> she got lots of experts to help her identifying the centipedes and the millipedes and the, these different obscure groups that there are only a handful of people in the world that can identify. But if she could find that many species in a small urban garden, then, you know, I imagine my garden's got many more. That's kind of the nice thing is wherever you live, no matter how small your garden, you can support a lot of wildlife. It might not be big dramatic stuff. You're unlikely to get a giant panda in your garden, but <laughs> butterflies and bees and earwigs and wood lice and all sorts of other things will come and live there quite happily. It amazes me that that study is still the most kind of comprehensive study we've got of urban gardens. And that was 1970s, was it? She started in the 70s. Right. It was published more recently. Yeah. And it is really bizarre that there's not a single other example in the whole no. world no. where someone has catalogued in detail the wildlife of a garden. It's astonishing, It really, is isn't astonishing. It? Did you read Doug Tallamy's Bring in Nature Home? No, I didn't. He writes about the importance of using native plants, but his stuff is all in the US. Because I read that, and I, I mean, I was ready to jump off a bridge. It makes such depressing reading. But I wondered how comparable it is to take the US example and the UK example, because somebody said to me, you know, where we used to be attached to the continent, you know, we kind of have, we can use lavenders because it's a kind of more of a near native than a native as such. Is that true? Or can we probably extrapolate some you know, stuff from his study and apply it to ourselves? The ecosystems of North America are not dissimilar to here, really. If you look at the plant families that are there and the insect families, and they're all pretty closely related, actually. I think that you'll find very similar patterns in both. And, and I think using North American plants in our gardens is completely fine. Again, if there's a native alternative that's just as good, then go for the native one. I mean, there are some North American plants which are absolutely amazing for insect life. Phacelia is commonly grown over here. Very few plants that will attract and feed as many bumblebees as Phacelia. Mm. It's a North American annual, but, you know, why not grow it here in a garden? It's different if you're talking about kind of natural habitats in the UK. So, you know, wildflower meadows should be full of native wildflowers. And that's where things sometimes get a little bit blurred because you can buy seed mixes, which are called wildflower mixes, to create a kind of meadow area, but they're chock full of non-native, often North American plants. And I think that's a bit naughty, really. I think if you're telling people they're wildflowers, People assume you mean native mm. if you say wild, but and of course they are wild, but just, just in, <laughs> in a different continent. <laughs> you can see this on Sussex University campus where I work. Yeah. They've been sowing strips and they put up signs saying wildflowers. They're basically annual flowers, but the large majority of them are not from Europe at all. They're things like cosmos and so on, which are pretty and they do attract insects. But they're not wildflowers. So if you're creating a wildflower meadow, it should be native, in my yeah. view. But if you're gardening, then, you know, planting your herbaceous border or whatever, then enjoy yourself and plant what the heck you like. You were talking about some new alternatives and you thought that they might be deliberately difficult to pronounce so that people kind of just glossed over them. Is there a danger that we've got rid of some things and that we're going to introduce others that are just as bad? Yeah, absolutely. If you look at history, we just keep making the same stupid mistakes over and over again. We started out when sort of synthetic pesticides really came into use just after the Second World War. A lot of them were developed in the war. You know, we had things like DDT and all the horrible relatives of DDT, like Lindane and so on. And everyone thought they were great. Until, turned out, they weren't great. And then all sorts of horrible side effects of terrible environmental damage. And eventually they were all banned. The organophosphates that came about more or less appeared at the same time as DDT. 
but it took quite a bit longer to realise that they were actually horribly toxic to people, and most of those have been banned. And various others, most of the carbamates have gone. Then you've got the neonicotinoids, which Europe has largely now banned. But new chemicals are coming onto the market, replacing the neonicotinoids. And the regulatory system has basically not changed. So it's nothing to stop things that are just as harmful as neonicotinoids appearing on the market. And there are all these new chemicals which are coming through the system. So things like flupyradifurone. It's really snappy, easy to remember. (laughs) Sulfoxaflor is a bit less of a tongue twister. Cyantronilipril is another one. You know, they're hard to remember, hard to get to grips with. I have wondered whether they deliberately give them such intractable, complicated names. And at any point in history, if you said to government, the regulators, you know, are the pesticides we're using safe? they will say, yes, of course. So right now, government says we have a strict regulatory procedure. Any pesticide that's licensed for use by farmers or gardeners in this country is completely safe. But 10 years from now or next week, they'll ban one because evidence will have emerged that it wasn't safe. And all the time we were using it happily, thinking it was safe. So, you know, 50, 60 years ago, they'd have told you DDT was completely fine. There were even adverts saying DDT is good for you that were used back in the day. Clearly, it wasn't good for you. It's kind of inevitable that unless we change the way we farm, we change our attitude to these chemicals, we're just going to keep making the same mistakes over and over again, going round and round in circles. And it's enormously frustrating. But it seems to me we need to question the whole way we grow food is wrong, in my view. That We've gone down this avenue of bigger and bigger fields, bigger and bigger farms, fewer and fewer crop varieties. We just grow a handful of different crops on a huge scale in the UK. And, you know, you get these fields of 50, 60, 70 hectares with no life in them at all. Each arable field gets treated with just over 17 different pesticides per year. So at the last year for which DEFRA have collected data, which I think is 2016, British farmers applied 16.9 thousand tonnes of pesticides to the landscape. All pesticides are toxins. They're designed to kill something, be it a fungus or an insect or a weed or whatever. It isn't just wildlife disappearing. We know that we've damaged our soils, that there's less carbon locked up in them than they used to be. They're less fertile than they used to be. We're polluting streams with fertilisers and pesticides. I, I think it's not sustainable, to put it simply. We've kind of gone down this avenue, and a lot of people just accept that industrial farming is necessary to feed everybody because obviously there are a lot of people in the world these days you know seven billion and counting but the way we're farming i think is doing so much environmental damage we need to come up with other ways of growing food they're there i think that with a little bit of investment we could easily develop types of farming which are much more sustainable and i think small scale farming basically moving away from the current system to persuading people that seasonal, locally produced, healthily produced food is what they should be eating. You know, we have this epidemic of obesity and diabetes in the UK, which is, there's a government estimate that it's currently costing £27 billion a year. And that's the product of people essentially eating badly and eating too much processed food, too much meat and so on. So it's good for everybody to move away from that and move towards local, seasonal, healthy produce. But we're not producing that. And the UK has to import 70-something percent of of all its fruit and veg because we hardly grow any. And yet we have a climate that's really good for growing fruit and veg. We could grow all of the apples we require. They store pretty well. So you could actually have British apples 12 months of the year. But we actually have hardly any British apples and they come from as far away as New Zealand, which is nuts. So the whole system is pretty crazy. It's interesting that with Brexit looming, whatever you think of Brexit, it frees us from the common agricultural policy, which has basically been this mechanism of subsidising industrial farming that we've been stuck in for the last 40 years. At the moment, we spend three and a half billion pounds a year of taxpayers' money, which goes to support farming. At the moment, most of it goes to the biggest farmers, which seems to be the wrong way around. They're not the ones that really need our support, I don't think. If I'm going to pay my taxes, I'd rather they went to someone that's producing healthy, sustainable food, suitable for consumption in this country, rather than big cash crops that go onto international commodities markets. If you took that three and a half billion and gave it all to small scale farmers, producing food primarily for local consumption, you could completely change the system. You could make it viable to be a small scale kind of market gardener, producing mixed fruit and vegetables, maybe chicken, eggs and whatnot as well, 
So there are things like permaculture and agroforestry and biodynamic gardening, which are considered a bit kind of left field and wacky, hippie kind of ways to grow food. But actually, the basic principles of them are really sound. Biodynamic does include a bit of kind of what seems to me like kind of witchcraft thrown in. But the basics of it, growing lots of different crops so that you don't have big monocultures, means that they're much less prone to pest outbreaks. You never clear large areas of soil so that it's not prone to erosion. So you look after the soil. You don't need the pesticides because you've got this high diversity of crops and good populations of natural enemies and pollinators and so on. And you're producing lots of fruit and veg. If they're intended for local consumption, there's not many food miles associated with that, minimal packaging required for that. People think that industrial farming must produce lots of food, but actually it isn't that productive. You get eight, maybe 10 tonnes per hectare of wheat. An intensive vegetable plot can produce easily 35 tonnes of mixed fruit and veg per year per hectare, which, you know, four times as much as an industrial farmer with his field of wheat. And at the same time, you're supporting biodiversity and looking after the soil, looking after the environment. So there are other ways of feeding everybody. We need to persuade both consumers and government to support a kind of radical shift in how we grow food. And I don't really see much appetite for that at the moment, certainly not from government. I mean, there's a growing sort of local food movement, which is nice, but it's still quite small scale. Some lovely stuff going on around Brighton, actually, where small scale growers kind of connecting with consumers to produce, you know, supply them with healthy local food. Still, you know, 95% of us go to the supermarket to buy our food and you've only got to walk along and look where the food's coming from to see that, you know, it's all heavily packaged and been flown in from Chile or wherever. (laughs) It's a nuts system of feeding people. And also, of course, we eat too much meat, which is strangely controversial. Some people really hate vegans, it seems. And to be fair, some vegans are rather militant in saying everyone should be banned from eating meat and so on. So it gets a bit silly. But it's a simple fact that eating grain-fed beef is really bad for the environment. It's a hopelessly inefficient way of feeding people. It takes less than a 30th of the land to grow vegetables to feed a person that it would if you want to grow vegetables, plant material to feed to a cow, to feed to a person. The number of people on the planet, we just haven't got the space to all be eating lots of meat. And it's not good for us to eat lots of red meat in particular. I don't argue that we should all go vegetarian i still eat meat but i just try to avoid eating very much and i don't eat red meat apart from as a a very rare treat now and again and make sure it's grass-fed when i do but you know it's not that big a sacrifice to just not eat too many burgers and it would be good for everybody yeah it's doable but at the moment i can't see it happening anyone who read a buzz in the meadow might be wondering have any of your apple trees in your orchard in france produced apples and were they edible they produce lots of apples most of them are really not very nice there is there's one tree that produces quite nice they're still pretty tart but i quite like them but out of 50 trees that's pretty disappointing but there's a lot that still haven't produced that it gets slowly growing Sadly, I think actually the soil and the climate are not quite optimal for apples. But the wildlife seem to enjoy them. I get loads of interesting insects feeding on the fruit, so it could be worse. So when's your new book, The Garden Jungle, out? 11th of July. Um, So we're nearly there. Excellent. uh, Yeah. It's been out in Germany since March. Got it translated into German and published it six months before the UK did. And it's doing really well there. So I'm optimistic. They say Britain is a nation of gardeners. You know, there's a lot of people out there busy gardening. And if I just hope some of them read it and garden in a slightly more, you know, gentle way and look after wildlife. If they do, you know, there's half a million hectares of gardens in the UK, which, you know, imagine they were all full of wildlife friendly flowers and food plants for butterflies and moths and no pesticides and so on. That, you know, would make a huge difference. I know I'm a bit ambitious to think that half a million gardeners might read my book, but, you know, even if one does, uh, that's something. By the time this interview goes out, Professor Gawson's book will have been out for a couple of days, and I can't recommend it highly enough. And as always, the links to where you can find out more about his work and his books are in the show notes. And just to go back to what I said in the intro about sourcing plants for your own or other people's gardens, as Dave says, the only real way is to buy plants that are organically grown or to propagate your own plants by cuttings or division or grow them from seed, which is really tough if you work as a professional gardener or designer. 
How are you supposed to deliver a garden to a client who wants it to look good as soon as it's planted? Well, the bottom line is that right now, unless your favourite trade nursery is able to grow without pesticides, you probably can't. But you can try to source plants from and support nurseries who are growing organically. And you can ask the question of your favourite nursery and maybe put a bit of pressure on them that way. I think everyone I speak to for the podcast is a genuine legend in their own field. I don't interview anyone whose work I don't fully believe in and whose opinion I don't respect. And that's the beauty of being in charge of my own media channel that has no outside influences. But in the case of Dave Goulson, I can't emphasise enough how much I respect and admire his work and the way he stands up to really powerful people and organisations. He is one of my proper heroes, so please do go and buy his book or reach out to him on social media to show your appreciation for his work and for taking part in this interview. Thanks for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.